so uh, it's great um, that I'm um, given the chance to talk here. And I really want to talk about a kind of consortium effort that's happening inside of the map. It's like a, a deepening part of the map community called the Mark Consortium. We were called something else, but we discovered that we overlapped with a different consortium. And uh, they asked us to change our name. I think this stands for something, the Minine Analysis and Reference Consortium. Uh, but uh, uh, that's it. So what are we trying to do? So the goal of this consortium is to provide a consistent set of data with tightly defined protocols. So, um, uh, and really end-to-end -end protocols. And that goes from the, from the growth to the details about how to uh, uh, load flow cells and other details. Um, and the goal is to do this in a multi-lab way so that we know, we understand where the variance is lab to lab uh, when we do this. Uh, having got an understanding of the variance between labs, uh, then we can explore the consequences on changing protocol details uh, of this. So for example, in particular, I think the sample um, uh, extraction and the details just before the kits go in on things like the read length, the 2D, and the input, uh, impact on uh, base modifications. And then finally, to understand and improve the analysis, we're about 60% wet, 40% dry in my terminology of people at the moment. We probably need to be 50-50, frankly. So if you're dry and you want to come and play with lots of data, this is the place to come uh, uh, for this. Uh, as you'll see, we'll have a lot of data. We have a lot of data now. So some ground rules of the consortium. If people know me, I'm, I uh, have played cat herder in chief of many consortia, and I know it's good to have some ground rules. Um, so this, the data is shared openly amongst the consortium and will be made to totally open, at least by publication, quite possibly beforehand, to be honest, but at least by publication. We have a very open discussion on the details and the analysis. There's a weekly phone call. Um, currently, this is at Monday at 8 p.m. UK time. There was a small voting uh, process this morning about whether we can tweak this to optimally align between childcare um, uh, uh, constraints in different parts of the world. So there's time zone and childcare trying to be factored in here. Um, people who join the consortium are not constrained for publication of their own data, but we've got to publish consortium to get to data together. So if you want to join, please come and join. Um, but those are the kind of basic bound, ground rules to, to live by. About 100 people have signed up looking at the wiki. About 20 groups, according to my stats, phone in on Mondays. Um, and about seven experimental groups and four analysis groups are actively working. This is actually a pretty good decay curve of, uh, of, of how a consortium like this work. I'd like to shift it more to the uh, bottom end. So if you feel enthusiastic, um, uh, join in. Uh, the MAP wiki hosts our discussions, so if you're part of the MAP program, you can go to the MARC site and browse around. Um, and Embel EBI provides the data hub for this uh, so that we have got all the data straight processed and the metadata straight uh, uh, for this. So what are our goals? Uh, we sort of founded in, at the end, of the end of last year and we formed over the last couple of months. And in fact, the first set of experiments have happened across the consortium, and that's called phase one, which is a very precise growth, extraction, prep, and flow cell run by five groups worldwide. And this is, in fact, distributed by Justin O'Grady, who talked earlier. It's this E. coli strain, K12, MG1655, MG and I believe he actually has some vials of it on his person now. So you can walk away uh, with the physical DNA uh, if you want to. Um, Phase one comes into two um, uh, uh, sub-phases, A and B. Um, Oxid Nanopore told us that they were going to change the kits a little bit on the front end, the adapter sequences. So we did both the March and the April kits. Um, and we've now moving into phase two, which is exploring the tweaking of the protocol really outside of the Oxid Nanopore setup. So that's about extraction, manipulation, how low the DNA can go, whether pre, uh, doing PCR beforehand will be good or not, but doing it all on the same sample and now with this baseline so that we know what the variance and what we should expect from, from the standard protocol should be across the group. And we have a sort of formal phase three, which is kind of other projects 
Um, but phase one and phase two are keeping us busy for sure. So we have uh, five groups worldwide for, that have completed phase 1A. In each of these phase 1A, they have run two different flow cells. That gives us a sense of flow cell to flow cell variability, as well as the lab to lab variability. So there's two each from uh, the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics in Oxford, from the ZF Screens Group in uh, Belgium, uh, UEA, um, uh, East Anglia, Cosming Harbor, Sarah, who just talked, um, in Long Island, and UCSC uh, on the West Coast. So we also get quite a good sampling of the shipping behavior as well in this uh, process. Um, an interesting thing here, what do we describe as a run? Inside of the consortium, we have decided that restarts don't mean a new run, even though they create a new set of directories inside of your metricore uh, process. And I'll come on in a little bit of a, a kind of joint vocabulary that we can all use about the phrase runs and stuff like that, which is another output of this consortium. It's just using words consistently between us. So overall, we have uh, 200,000 odd 2D reads, about a gigabase now. This means we're getting to 300x coverage of this single E. coli. I suspect this E. coli will, we will know more about the bases in this E. coli than uh, on nanopore than anything else on the planet. Uh, which will be my goal. Uh, uh, so as you can see, if you're a data analyst and you want to understand variants, this is the place uh, to come uh, for this stuff. Um, Matt Luce from Nottingham, who I believe is also talking uh, tomorrow, is that right? Yeah. Uh, has a great um, uh, kind of live um, system called Minotaur, uh, which can process and give uh, stats. And I'm actually going to show initial results from Matt now. There's not actually much more analysis that have been done because the, the files were only put together about two weeks ago, but we are at this stage. So just what I'm plotting, or what Matt is, sorry, what Matt is plotting here is uh, for many different parameters of runs, uh, uh, the behavior of the two runs, run one and run two, um, across these different samples. We don't really have enough points to be sure about the lab effect. We will have more after phase 1b is processed because there will effectively be four points per lab. And you can see the labs listed here. Very crudely, if you see positive and strong correlation uh, on these plots, it means that there is a between lab effect that's affecting that uh, thing. If there is not correlation, then there's probably less between lab effect in this system. So. Uh, for example, this max reads per pore, and when we exclude one uh, center, there was one run from Oxford that ran too fast, basically. Um, that is something that shows quite a lot of linearity. And there's some other parameters here. For example, the number of 2D reads, and this is related to the total number of reads, template and complement is really, this is your key metric, which is the number of 2D reads that come out of each run. Um, and again, we're going to have some fun trying to work out um, where the variance happens between different runs using this data set. Oops, lots of different things that Matt can produce. Ooh, even more. OK, so this is read length as well. Um, one thing to stress here is all the different groups really used, or at least I would say tried to use, precisely the same protocol, including the way they sheared DNA down to the machine that they sheared DNA on, though that wasn't quite true, but at least the amount of G-force and stuff like that. So really try and lock down where the variance is coming here. Later on, in phase two, groups are going to change those parameters. For example, trying to use far lower G-force in shearing, trying to use no G-force at all in shearing, trying to do exciting things. John Tyson from Vancouver wants to get away with shearing at all in this process for long reads. So there's a lot of things to explore once we understand this standard protocol in detail. Moment. Um, we also have a number of really excellent um, computational groups that are part of this. In particular, uh, uh, Meeton Jane from the UCSC group with Benedict Payton and Hugh has done alignments, and I think he will also be talking about this using marginal line. And from this data, marginal line produces the 
by far the best set of alignments uh, in terms of percentage identity, and it's really about changing the way insertions and deletions uh, interoperate with the alignment process for the alignment geeks in the audience. We know that this has been a, it's a, it's a long held parameter trade-off about how you handle your insertions and deletions against your substitutions, and Meaton has, and, and Benedict have a, um, uh, a posterior uh, probability process uh, to bring this out. Um, and uh, uh, of course, you just heard from Jared, who has this event aligner scheme as well, uh, which we're exploring. The goal is, is to centralize some commonly used alignment routines at the Emble EBI data hub so that analysts, downstream analysts, don't have to necessarily worry about creating a diversity of input alignments to this process, and people can look uh, further down. So as I mentioned, another um, issue is just getting our language consistent. So for example, there's a, um, an interesting question about what you call the different types of HDF5 files that you get out of Metricore as they go through the different processes. They're all labeled .hdf5, but the content inside of the files are different depending on what stage you are in the system. So for example, across the consortium, we would like to call these files either bulk, which is switching on the process that gets every single sample stored into the HDF5 file. This seriously explodes your HDF5 file, and you'll need to install a new disk um, or have some process on your laptop uh, uh, to capture that data, but we'd like to call that bulk. This is the normal set, which we would call reads, and those are called into events. And then base called means it's gone through the base calling of Metricore. It will have the event files, but also the base calls at the same time. Another thing that I just mentioned there is whether the phrase run should include restarts or not include restarts. And I think the consensus from the consortium is that a run is really about a sample prep going on and restarts should be merged into one run rather than to separate out the process of restarting. If you're not aware of this, sometimes for all sorts of reasons, the, the MinIron device might stop. And also very deliberately, I, I can't remember what it is, 24 hours in or 12 hours in, at some point it decides to change the voltage and switch the pause that it's uh, sampling, uh, which is equivalent, which you can do, force it by doing a restart. And so you'll see in your Minan runs that there's a sudden point of spike when it will recapture a new, it will reuse a new set of pores um, uh, in this. We also have a proposal for handling alignments. Um, in many ways, some of the alignments when they're base pairs are fine because you don't need to, uh, that, that's a very standard bioinformatic product. Um, but the alignments of events um, uh, into the reference reads are somewhat different because events are not necessarily associated with a base called base. And therefore, you have to think carefully about that. And we are, are going to explore uh, how to store this in the BAM CRAM world, SAM BAM CRAM world, so that there's a way of different people thinking about creating event alignments and people consuming them in a compressed form uh, robustly. Um, this is a proposal that's gone to SAM tools and gone to the Mark consortium, and I don't expect we'll settle down until we've really got implementations of it, and we all know it's good, and we know what's going on with fast mode. Uh, so there will be a lot of things uh, need to settle before that, but we're thinking ahead. So what are the perspectives of this consortium over the next um, couple of months? So we will be processing another 10 runs, which is phase 1B, and that will provide sharper clarity in what I would call lab effects, um, which is really what parts of the process show a strong lab-specific variance or lab-specific mean. And that, that tells us where some of the variance happens. So for example, it's already clear that read length and this is no surprise, it's a stronger lab effect than base pair identity, and that's, that's exactly what you expect. That's a process that happens in the lab and not on the pool. Um, excellent data set to understand sources of variance in the ONT data, inherent lab and systematic. So for example, with this level of coverage, it's not merely that we can have a KEMA-based model of signal, 
but we really, for this E. coli, can think about a reference-based model of signal. So every reference base or every reference schema, what we believe its signal is. Um, and then from that, see how well this schema-based model fits, where it falls down. For example, this E. coli does have modifications that we know many of the DNA that people are putting in have modifications, so methylations, cytosine and adenosine or other places. And so that should come out in this signal-based view of the, of the data if we get the alignment right. And then we can ask questions about either folding that back into the model or detecting it or, or other things. It should either improve the quality of the whole process of the signal decoding um, and also improve the biological understanding uh, over time. I just want to give a huge amount of thanks to the fellow Mark Consortium. I did not manage, I managed to get a picture of David Buck on my phone, but I did man not manage to get it from my phone to my computer before I gave the slide over. So, David, are you in the audience? Do you want to wave? Yes, that's probably not very useful, actually. <laughs> David is over there. Somebody, somebody uh, says, hi, I'm David Buck. He's, he's that person there. Um, and uh, huge credit to these five labs who have done these standard runs, and a particular credit to Justin, who played air traffic control for the physical DNA and got it sent out to all of the different people. Um, and these are the main people who've done analysis. Uh, Vadim, who's not here, uh, has played air traffic control for the data. Um, that's all um, handled in a, in a pretty sane and, and standardized way so that we can just press a button for publication uh, when we want to. And then Matt Luce, in particular, has generated a whole bunch of statistics from this. Meaton and Jared are the two aligners, uh, uh, that were kind of class A aligners that we're using to analyze this data. And with that, I will end. Thank you very much. <laughs> Got lots of time for questions. Yeah. Ian? Question. Okay. okay, do you want to go back? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, very nice, uh, very, very nice talk, I enjoyed it. So, um, interlaboratory variation is very good, but may I assume that the instruments you use came from the same batch? The pores are the same, you know, similar yeah. batch, or so, not? Yeah. yeah, so we spent some time, actually, with Rosemary, um, uh, trying to get, for that phase 1A, one consistent batch set out, sent out. You know, I think it's going to... It's not credible to ask ONT to have one batch for six months that kind of dribbles out. So we just need to, but for that phase 1A process, they did come from the same batch. We saw, did see flow cell to flow cell variability, and that's why it's quite important that that Oxford run, which the Oxford guys knew wasn't you know, stunning, or any good at all, actually, the first time round. Uh, it's still in that phase 1A precisely for that reason to, to understand that flow cell to flow cell variability. Yeah. Uh, by the way, one of the criteria is that one should QC the flow cell first. So it's not that one just takes the flow cell off the thing. The flow cell goes into a QC. If, the, if QC of the flow cell fails, you take another flow cell. So the QC of the flow cell on the lab site is part <coughs> of the protocol uh, uh, before one commits to, to running on it. Uh, thanks for that talk, you and, um, and and for the whole day of talks today. It's just been fabulous, and and um, and that's uh, that's a great culmination to it. Uh, I, I'm sure you appreciate that for an alignment geek, mm -hmm. this this kind of stuff is, is absolutely overstimulating. Um, <laughs> I have, <laughs> I have uh, so yeah. you know, I have lots of kind of technical ideas and questions that I'd love to chat with you and other people who are interested about at the bioinformatics uh, mm -hmm. breakouts. Um, you know, one thing that just came to mind when you're talking about the compression is that you can probably compress even without re event alignment, without reference alignment, just based on event calling. You know, once you've segmented things Absolutely. up into groups that have got roughly the same mean and standard deviation, you could do probably lossless compression just based on that. And so I, I was kind of wondering if, you know, what, what you see as, it's going more into the biological side of things, you're talking about uh, perhaps sequence modifications and so on being detectable. So do you, do you have some idea of like what, just what could be picked up with that? Yeah, well, so I think it's very clear that any kind of modification is, is definitely going to look basically like another letter. Yeah? I mean, conceptually. 
and therefore should affect all the KMERS around it. Um, and I think it's incredibly interesting for us to get into the, this processing. I mean, for people who know, there's this pre-CR process that happens before the, the, the native DNA goes, and I'm not quite sure if it happens before or after ligation, but anyway, it happens somewhere in the system to try and clean up the DNA. But it's sort of clear that there's something, some stuff doesn't get cleaned up by that. So I think it's a really interesting question to understand how modifications read out in the signal and the relationship between modified bases and unmodified bases. I, I don't know if we should expect anything systematic. Going to your point about compression, I mean, <laughs> you know just as well as I do that modeling, there is a, there's, a, there's an absolute symmetry between modeling and compression. If we model our data better and we understand it, we compress our data better because we understand it. And that, that, that unity between modeling and compression, I think, is quite a good mentality to bring here. And there is a thought of thinking about event calling as optimal compression on, the, on that with a noise model of variance. I mean, I think that's all up, up for debate about all, you, you know, this is, there's a really rich area of exploration here. And as with any technology, we've, we've kind of get, got to get our heads around the low level signal as well as a biological application for this. So come play um, at the low, low end, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, one at the back there. Hi, this is Robert Boise from the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. And this is just a minor uh, footnote, but potentially a helpful one. And I, I'll apologize in advance for putting in a plug for my poster. OK. Uh, what we've been able to do in collaboration with Intel uh, is to show proof of concept for running the MinION uh, in a VM. And there are now uh, low noise uh, small form factor server platforms that will allow us to run multiple uh, MinION devices concurrently off of uh, a single, uh, what I would call a benchtop server. So you could imagine that coupled with uh, liquid handling robot where you could scale uh, the op concurrent operation of multiple devices. And we think that's important for the software development community to be able to start modeling networks uh, of MinIons. And so the intersection or overlap or complement with the mark is that there are other, uh, how should I put it, better funded uh, institutions which may be able to incorporate that in their work in the map. And so we just wanted to share that with you. I'll come and visit your poster. Thank you. Thanks, you. That's my pleasure.